express my extreme gratitude to the Cotter Foundation for the privilege of being here this morning. Your Highness, Vice President Haudi, distinguished guests, it's my, my great honor to give a short talk about science, concentrating not on the scientific details or methods, but on that component which is so precious to science, mentioned by Vice President Haudi in his address. And this is the human component, the people that do the science. Now, I think the message really, really could be well illustrated by a discussion of science, and so I'm going to share with you some of the studies we've undertaken in our laboratory, but again, concentrating not upon the technology as much as the humans involved. We got into a field by sheer serendipity. I'm a blood specialist. I was studying the rhesus blood group antigen. We developed methods, as shown here, to isolate the core polypeptides from red cells. And if you notice, below the 32 kilodalton polypeptide, there's something labeled at 28 kilodaltons, referred to as a proteolytic fragment. We thought this was a breakdown of the Rh protein. It turned out to be a contaminant, but a very interesting contaminant, and one which consumed a, our curiosity over a number of years. But as a small laboratory, even at Johns Hopkins, laboratories are, are small, composed of young scientists, we were stuck. And I, I brought this problem to many scientists that I discussed with uh, the, the issue, thinking that this protein in red blood cells might be a channel. I was assured by all the experts that red cells had no channels. And then I had the great fortune of speaking with a colleague at the University of North Carolina, shown here, John Parker, a physician, a scientist, and a very generous individual who shared time with me and had the insight that this new polypeptide, this new protein we isolated, actually may have a very interesting and important function. It was his observation, not mine, that caused us to change directions. He predicted that this might be the long-sought protein that transports water into and out of cells. Now, water is frequently in the world news, usually because of disasters, the tsunami disaster, the Katrina disaster, the melting of the Greenland ice cap, the predicted change in the Gulf Stream. And here, of course, in Qatar, the ability to survive on the edge of the desert beside the sea is due to the ability to generate fresh water. Water is important on a global scale, but water is also very, very dangerous. Disequilibrium leads to these disasters. And even a tranquil Arctic stream turns into a torrent when it drops a meter in altitude. Our cells are composed of, primarily of water. 70% of my body mass is water, and this is something shared amongst all of us. All life forms are primarily water. Water has often been referred to as the solvent of life. But how is it that water enters and leaves cells that crosses specific tissues? And this problem had been uh, considered by biophysicists for some time, and I'll give just a little background here. Shown in the top left is a simple membrane bilayer representing the plasma membranes of our cells. And as indicated, water diffuses into and out of the cells rather slowly. A subset of physiologists and biophysicists from around the world, very dedicated scientists, doing delicate experiments, made observations that, that indicated that special membranes, such as the membranes of renal tubules in our kidneys, secretory glands, sweat glands, salivary glands, and red blood cells must have another pathway, a special pathway permeated by water, and we know this now to be the fact. Now, the difference between these two tissues may seem a bit subtle, but functionally it's quite important. All cells are permeated by water th by diffusion. Some cells with these putative water channels have a very high capacity to move water, very selective for water, with the movement being determined by osmotic gradients. Now, in 1970, the year I began my medical studies, an important experiment was undertaken by a young scientist at the University of California. We're using chemical reagents. He studied the diffusion of water into cells by going through a chemical uh, uh, repertoire and finding that agents that caused disorder of the lipid bilayer increased leak. And then he tested one compound which gave extraordinarily different results, mercuric chloride. It could stop water transport, it could turn it on, and he concluded correctly that there must be proteinaceous water channels, channels in the membranes of cells that can swell and shrink rapidly. But no one believed him because he couldn't isolate it. So based on the hypothesis provided by our colleague, we tested this. 
And this involved young people, and the story will really circle out, circulate around the young people who did the studies. So to test the ability of a membrane channel to be freely permeated by water, we had to express it, express it in a test system. And shown here are two frog eggs, about a millimeter in diameter. In the springtime, frogs lay eggs in freshwater ponds, and they're dormant. They have low water permeability. So the idea is if we could express this new protein in the eggs of frogs, they should be osmotically active. And so we've done so here. On the left is a control oocyte. On the right is a test oocyte. And this is a, after three days in incubation in, in isotonic culture medium. And then they were rapidly transferred to distilled water. And what you should see is the oocyte on the left has failed to swell. The oocyte on the right has swollen rapidly and exploded due to osmosis. And this is work of a young scientist here celebrating, Gregory Preston, who came to our laboratory from very humble backgrounds and did extraordinarily important science, which changed the direction of our laboratory and the laboratories of many others. We teamed up with other scientists, and I'll tell you about some more established scientists as well as the younger scientists, to solve the structure of these proteins. The structures of proteins will oftentimes reveal the molecular functions. And teaming up with Yoshinori Fujiyoshi from Kyoto University and Andreas Engel from the Biocentrum at the University of Basel in Switzerland, we solved the structure of the protein referred to now as aquaporin-1, the membrane water channel, in three dimensions at atomic resolution. And what you should see on the left is a, 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 an image of the protein as viewed from the, above the cell. And what you should see in the very center there is an aqueous pore three angstroms in diameter, big enough for water and not big enough for any other solutes. And on the right, we have a panel viewed in cross-section where the channel runs from the top to the bottom. And as shown in this schematic, you can see the water channel protein provides a pathway for water for, to move from the extracellular surface through the channel to the intracellular surface with special barriers to the movements of salts and ions. Now, as a medical physician, as a medical doctor, I'm very interested in, in, in biology and physiology. <clears throat> we felt the precise localization of this protein in kidney would tell us what it does. And for these studies, we teamed up with a young scientist from Denmark, Soren Nielsen, who is a specialist in high-resolution microscopy with a particular interest in kidney. Our kidneys are, are in place for two very important functions to excrete waste while retaining water and to maintain our blood acid concentrations. And to do this, the plasma of our blood is purified by filtration. And the filtration occurs, passes through tubules. Having a little trouble getting the pointer here. There it is. The tubules, which have an inner lining surrounded by an amplified membrane, which is very heavily containing a large amount of aquaporin-1 protein. And this diagram shown here shows how water moves from the primary urine. If you imagine primary urine at the top of the slide, entering through the cell, passing through the cell, and leaving the, the, the inner membrane through the aquaporin-1 protein, providing a rapid movement of water from primary urine to the interstitium and back, back into our blood. And this is important because in a typical day, the average human being will filter 180 liters of plasma. Yet we can only make a very small volume of urine. If we released 180 liters of urine, of course, we would die rapidly of dehydration. So this pathway to reabsorb 99% of the water is very efficient and essential for life. Now, we were, in collaboration with a group of scientists from the United Kingdom, able to identify individuals with mutations in the gene encoding the aquaporin-1 protein. And shown in the center is such an individual. This photograph I am showing with her permission. And beside her are two young scientists from the laboratory, Melanie Bonivier, a postdoc, and Landon King, who is the director of the Johns Hopkins Pulmonary Division. And the phenotyping, the analysis of the importance of the protein was, was undertaken with great care. So this individual, again, the lady shown in the center, has knockout mutations in the genes encoding the aquaporin-1 protein. But if you look co closely at the photograph, I think you would conclude that she looks pretty normal. In fact, she, she does look normal. She feels normal. But the importance of this protein only becomes, becomes manifest during times of stress. And the stress which revealed the importance of this protein was the thirsting. 
that we all experience. In a typical evening, we'll go to bed, sleep seven or eight hours, we awaken in the morning, we've had nothing to drink for seven or eight hours, we've been thirsted. And to survive thirsting after overnight uh, uh, dehydration, we, we uh, concentrate our urine. In the panel to the right, you should see uh, uh, the values for the concentration of urine from 15 normal individuals, shown here, and what they represent is, <laughs> I'm not very technologically adept, I'm sorry. The values are about 1,000 milliosmolars in concentration. This is a concentration of seawater. To the center of that panel, you see the, the concentration of urine after overnight thirsting for the acroporin one null individuals is only about 420 milliosmolar. So they cannot fully concentrate their urine. They do well after overnight thirsting, but we become severely dehydrated if the thirsting were prolonged. So it's an important feature for survival when water is limiting. And of course, here in Qatar, in the interior, water is limiting. All organisms are very efficient in the use of water. The kidneys of the desert mammals, the rodents, are extraordinarily efficient in this pathway and can survive because their kidneys are five to ten times more efficient than our kidneys. Another important manifestation of the aquaporin 1 protein is shown in the capillaries and lung. And I'll just briefly mention on the left is an image. The L overlies a breathing tubule and the V overlies a small venule. And these are from normal individuals at baseline. And if you notice the structures in the right-hand panel, the same, the same structures after infusion of three liters of physiological saline. So the venule has become expanded because of the increased vascular volume. But if you look closely at the breathing tubule, Again, mark L, the wall on the right-hand panel is thicker than the wall on the left. And this is due to the release of water from the venules due to the acroporin 1 protein. We cannot measure this in the acroporin 1 null individuals. And just to illustrate the work of another young scientist, this was actually a technique, Elias, does it look familiar? Perfected by a young scientist who came to Johns Hopkins about 30 years ago. We were young once. Elias came from Algeria developed these techniques which we still use today in our hospital, our clinics, and in our research laboratories. I'm going to briefly talk about some of the other members of the family. Some of them are permeated by glycerol, and this turns out to be important in maintaining skin integrity. The glycerol transporting proteins are also important, uh, the slide was out of order, in, in the functions of red cells. So, I apologize for not having my slides in perfect order here. You know, you make these last minute adjustments just before you come on and it's always a mistake. In, in, in this slide, I've, I've represented the 12 members of the human aquaporin family, just to illustrate that there are several members and they're formed of two subsets, those permeated by water, the aquaporins, and those permeated by glycerol, the aquaglyceroporins. And I've talked about the AQP1 protein. I'm gonna tell you about some of the others now briefly. I talked about aquaporin-3 in skin, and uh, it's also present in kidney. Now, the aquaporin-2 protein in kidney is important in the final concentration steps that occur when we become severely thirsted. It's residing in the collecting ducts of kidney within cells at baseline and at the surface of the cells when we're, we're uh, thirsted and vasopressin levels rise. So if you look closely, the black dots represent immunogold decoration of aquaporin vesicles within the cell in the upper panel and at the surface of the cell at the bottom. And it's probably a little easier to understand in the figure at the right where you see an intercellular vesicle residing within a renal collecting duct cell and vasopressin stimulates its movement to the cell surface. Now, what are the consequences of this in medicine? And the fact is the consequences are really quite important. Rare individuals with mutations in the gene encoding aquaporin-2 are found to have a very severe disease referred to as nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. It's quite rare. It has been identified in children of a number of Arab families, and this represents an inability to concentrate urine, and these children can only survive if they drink 20 liters or more of fluid per day because they make such large volumes of urine. So severe, but fortunately rare. Defects in the aquaporin-2 pathway are also found in common manifestations, such as congestive heart failure, where excess expression of the protein causes fluid retention. And the opposite is found in diseases of uh, polyuria, such as bedwetting, where underexpression of the protein leads to inability of the children to concentrate their urine. 
Of course, bedwetting is a very common problem, and the children outgrow it, but again, it illustrates the importance of this protein family. Another member of the family, Acroporin Zero, present in Lens, work undertaken by Masato Yasui, a young scientist from Keio University in Tokyo, who's now back in Keio University as the chairman of the pharmacology department. Mutations in Acroporin Zero gene causes cataracts in small children. Another member of the family, referred to as Aquaporin-4, is the water channel present in brain. And this is work undertaken with colleagues in Scandinavia, Ole Petter Otterson and his team at the University of Oslo. So in brain, our capillaries are quite, are quite importantly protected by astroglial end feet. And the reason is that our, in the periphery, our capillaries are quite fragile and easily ruptured. You twist your ankle jogging, the ankle swells. In brain, the capillaries are protected because any increase in brain volume due to an injury causes compression of adjacent brain tissue and can lead to permanent brain damage. And the acroporin-4 protein, if you look closely, the black dots represent the presence of this protein at the interface of capillaries with brain parenchyma. And this distribution predicted this protein must be very important in the manifestations of brain edema, which follows head injury or stroke. Now, the work of a young scientist, Mahmoud Amiri Mahadam, and I just mentioned him a little bit to you because he came from a refugee camp in Pakistan to the University of Oslo and has become now one of the world's leading neuroscientists. Mahmoud's work has indicated the acroporin-4 protein leads to uh, the accelerated brain damage after defining brain injury. And just simply shown here are a series of panels from mice the normal mice sustained a defining brain injury, and the rose color represents viable brain tissue. The mutant mice and the mutations causing mislocalization of the acroporin-4 protein have preservation of brain tissue. And these studies and others confirming it indicate that new medicines that cause an inhibition of the acroporin-4 protein would be ideal in terms of managing, preventing, or ameliorating brain edema. Another member of the family, acroporin-5, cloned by Surabhi Rayina, a young scientist from Banaras Hindu University who came to our laboratory several years ago. Acroporin-5 is present in secretory glands, including sweat glands. What you should see in this panel is the pause from two mice. On the left is a wild-type mouse, a normal mouse, and the blue dots represent functional sweat glands after pilocarpine stimulation. On the right, we have a paw from an Acroporin-5 knockout mouse, this is studied by Lenny Nasim from the University of Aarhus in Denmark. And what you should see is that the, the knockout mouse, while having normal sweat glands, normal appearing sweat glands, they have glands which are hypofunctional, meaning the mouse can't sweat when stimulated. Now, survival of mice is not determined usually by the ability to sweat. The ability of humans to survive hyperthermia or to survive in water-restricted uh, environments is related to the, or in hyperthermic environments, is related to the ability to sweat, a very important human man, uh, function. Now back to the aquaglyceroporins. I showed the picture of skin where aquaglyceroporin is present in the basal levels. I apologize again, it was out of order. The protein is very important in red cells because this is, the man, this is the main pathway by which glycerol enters red cells. And in the manifestations of malaria, this becomes very important. Malaria, one of the world's great killers, is a curious disease. And in the red cell stage, the parasite enters red cells and can grow and divide within vesicles, eating in the entire cell's hemoglobin with the release of 32 daughter cells. And so this is an individual ring stage of the parasite. And if you look at this peripheral micrograph, you can see in the center a ring stage. And at the far right, you'll see uh, what we call a schizont, a red cell which has been parasitized. And after a couple of days, all of the hemoglobin has been eaten by the parasite. And this will now rupture, releasing the daughter cells. And when the rail cells lice, this leads to the tremendous malarial fevers, which are so toxic. So the acroporin pathways provide a new way of approaching the malaria problem, we think, with the development of medicines, which may be important as drug resistance emerges for existing medicines. The pathway is also important in the uh, passage of the infection through the mosquitoes. Mosquitoes carry malaria, and they don't transport it just innocuously. The blood stage, or the, the, the blood meal which the Anopheles females take, 
requires the rapid movement of fluid through the mosquito so that the mosquito is light enough to fly again. So if you look at the far right of the slide, you see the proboscis in the skin. And if you look to the far left, you can see the release of fluid from the Malpighian tubules. This is, again, another aquaporin pathway important in the infection. And of course, malaria is really important because it affects the poorest of the poor. In regions such as Sub-Saharan Africa, it's, it's a major killer with approximately one million children, children such as these, dying every year. And several million surviving but being left brain damaged due to the swelling that occurs during cerebral malaria. So it's a very large and a very important program, a problem for which we really, really need to address our, our, our laboratory functions and our clinical activities. I'll close by talking about two other pathways in the aquaporin glycerol transport mechanism, aquaporin 7, which is present in fat, and aquaporin 9, which is present in liver. Now, in his address, Elias mentioned obesity, a new, a new epidemic which we're facing in the United States. And the reason we're facing this is because genetically, we are very efficient at storing fat. Native populations in particular faced starvation every winter into the last century. And energy is stored in fat in the form of triglycerides. And when fasting or starvation occurs, triglycerides are lysed. The glycerol is released through aquaporin, aquaglyceroporin 7, where it's taken up by the liver and through aquaglyceroporin 9 and converted to glucose. So this pathway allows us to maintain blood glucose levels during fasting and even for starvation. Now, one of the really interesting things about science is the surprises which always occur when some scientist undertakes uh, an experiment with un unexpected results. And, and, and th this work, by the way, I should mention, is the work of Jen Carby. The, 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 the work I'm talking about with the aquaporin, aquaglyceroporin 7 and 9 by Barry Rosen and his team at Wayne State University in Michigan identified a su surprising pathway for the movement of arsenic into and out of cells through the aquaglyceroporin pathway. Now, you might think arsenic movement into cells is that important. And in fact, in some parts of the world, particularly in Bangladesh, where the groundwater, the surface water is contaminated by cholera, the groundwater drawn through tube wells turns out to have high levels of arsenic. So the manifestations of arsenic toxicity re reflect the presence of aquaporin 9 because this is the excretion pathway for the removal of arsenic from our bodies. Shown in this slide on the far left is a liver slide from a normal mouse. The center panel B shows the failure to stain with the antibody because the aquaglyceroporin 9 gene has been disrupted. And the aquaporin glyceroporin 9 null mice are unable to excrete arsenic into their feces and they die prematurely. Plants also have aquaporin pathways, particularly in the rootlets where they take up water from the ground and shown in this slide, which I borrowed from Ralph Kaldenhoff from the University of Würzburg, you see a, a wild type Arabidopsis on the right and a genetically modified Arabidopsis on the left. And the plant on the left has been modified to reduce the rootlet expression of the aquaporins. But notice the plant maintains its foliage by sending out increased arborization of rootlets. The movement of water through plants involves numerous different aquaporin pathways. And most plants have in the range of 50 different aquaporin genes. And a line of research which may allow us to drive plants with resistance to droughts or have growth advantages in desert environments may involve the manipulations of the aquaporin pathway. So I've talked about the discovery of the aquaporin, some of the specific path transport pathway phenomena, and some of the diseases. But I'd like to close by talking about the young people, because this is really the message I want to convey. A lot of scientific details, yes, but each one is a story revealed by the hard work of a young person that's come to my laboratory from around the world. And it's really these young people that carry the science and will continue to carry the science tomorrow. And the investment here in Qatar, in your education city, with the development of scientific opportunities for young people will bring wonderful manifestations in the future as their careers develop. And we can look forward to continued science as long as we have young people. But without their participation, science will be truncated at the current level of technology, and that's not enough. So I would hope the young people, when they get to be my stage of development towards the end of the career and look back, will think about their work and realize it was hard. It was oftentimes uh, difficult. It required weeks, months, or years away from home. 
but led to observations which were phenomenally interesting, exciting, and may well in the end lead to improvements, improvements for the individuals, their families, their countries, and for the world. And with that, let me thank the Foundation for sponsoring my trip. I look forward to meeting with you and spending more days here in Qatar.